Hello, and welcome once again to a brand new episode of Cinemaholics. I am not your usual host, John Negroni, who is unfortunately absent, but me, your regular co-host, Will Ashton, a features writer for Collider, and thankfully I'm not here alone. I have my good buddy, and let's see, so you wanted to be called an avid film watcher, I remember that. I'm trying to remember what else we were saying before we started this, but... Um, throughout cinema lover, so yeah, cinema lover, yeah. Either either <laughs> one works, yeah. <laughs> a fan of movies. It's Mike Zer, my good friend. How you doing, man? I am I am wonderful. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you be here because um, yeah, you were saying this is the first time you've ever been on a podcast, right? Yes, this is my first, very first time. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's, I, I'm very excited that this podcast can be a source for people to, like start podcasting because this has happened at least like a couple times like people i know can start their podcasting history or whatever the word would be through this and it's it's very exciting for me because it's like yeah you know it's like you're kind of like entering a new era or something i don't know it's very exciting for me i don't know what it is but i like it i mean from here on on i might just start doing podcasts for yeah why not we'll we'll see you never know yeah (laughs) i mean it's fun for me too because like we've had so many discussions about films after years you if listeners don't know mike's the guy who regularly comes with me to like anytime i have an advanced screening you're the first person i ask because you're usually available and willing to see pretty much anything (laughs) that i have uh screenings for which is very fortunate though the sad thing is that a lot of times the screenings i do get are never for like you know the good movies like i don't know like uh what's coming up now that looks good or is going to be good um like bonchi's virushin hearing that movie's amazing haven't heard a word about the screenings for that tar there are screenings i i can't get one for the life of me that, that can work but a movie like amsterdam which is our main discussion for this week the new film by david o russell is a film i got a screening to and thankfully you could join me but uh yes. as we'll discuss <laughs> in a bit maybe not the the best film to get a screening for <laughs> no but hey at least it was it was free so can't that's true that. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that's they should put that on the poster at least it was free <laughs> uh yeah so um yeah anyway uh i'll just say if you want more episodes cinemaholics you can always find the full archive at cinemaholics.com which is where we have written reviews video reviews regular episodes bonus material whatever you want you can find it there but enough about the podcast let's just talk about the movies themselves or more specifically let's talk about one that hasn't come out yet but is going to come out i think in april is that one this movie's coming out yeah yeah i think april 7th yeah so after a long delay we finally got our first look at the upcoming illumination mario movie or more accurately the super mario brothers movie i believe is what they're calling it right now um yes. which uh is a film that i've been cautiously optimistic i don't know if that's the right phrase to use but i feel like i've been nervous dreading and excited for this movie all at once since it was announced what's your relationship with this film yeah i mean you know kind of the same thing grew up playing the mario games and it's a character very uh near and dear to my heart so you know uh, same boat as you i definitely uh nervous but excited at the same time and now that we have the trailer you know kind of yeah. some of those fears and everything have kind of come to light with, mm-hmm. with some some choices they made with the casting and things like that but you know um yeah right yeah i mean it's but like we talked you know we talked a little bit about it like the, the art style i think they kind of nailed and you know come, some of the character models look really nice um but right overall uh yeah still just very curious to see how it all pans out and how it plays out so yeah well i was gonna ask you have you seen the the 90s one i, I know we've talked about it but i forget if you've seen it yes i have yeah and i okay. um as as a child i thought that was just um you know that was just Mario to me. Like, I, I don't think I even thought <laughs> they were connected, like the two, the video game and the movie. Um, you know, I just was like, oh, that's just a totally different thing. That's just named Mario. And then as I got yeah. older, you know, like you watch me as a kid and you're like, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. And mm-hmm. then you find out how horribly panned it was, you know, right. how, how horribly it was received. And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess that was kind of trash. So. <laughs> right. I was thinking about this this week, especially with the trailer out. Um, that 93 movie the one with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo. I think that might have been the first time I watched a movie and didn't like it. 
I can't remember exactly if it was like one of the first, but I just remember very vividly like Mario or more specifically Mario Party 2, I think is the very first video game I ever played. That's like the very first time I remember like getting a game, getting excited about playing a video game and playing it relentlessly, just being like, oh, okay, like this is what the joy of video games are. And when I heard there was like a Mario Brothers movie, I was like, oh, it's like, you know, merging of the two worlds. Like I can finally like see this thing I love in my favorite art form, the cinema. And I was like, this is going to be great. This is like going to be one of my favorite movies. And I just remember there's like a cold opening where they're, they're explaining like how dinosaurs transformed into like these lizards in the sewers. And there's like a dinosaur with like a Brooklyn accent or something. Is this all sounding right to you from your sort recollection? Of. It's been a very long time <laughs> since I've seen it, but yeah, I mean, that does sound vaguely familiar now that you're explaining it. Right. So I, I just remember that was like the moment, just like I had this feeling of dread that kind of came over me and I was just like, Oh no, like this isn't, this isn't right. Like this, what's going on? And then like, I see, you know, I didn't take any issue with, uh, Bob Hoskins as Mario. I mean, obviously I love two frame Roger rabbit. I was like, he makes sense. You know, he's Mario and John Leguizamo, Sid from ice age. He can be Luigi. <laughs> I took no issue with this, but I was just like, why is Bowser a human? Like, why is he this Trump adjacent guy? I, I don't think I was making that comparison at that age, but like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's going like, that's not Bowser. And it's like, well, was, was Yoshi's he Bowser a dinosaur? Or was he King Koopa? That's, I think, yeah, I think they might have called him King Koopa. I, I'm kind of going off of hazy recollections. I've probably only right. watched this movie once. Uh, yeah. Which um, I, but I think Bowser is the King Koopa in a way right. or whatever. So it's the same thing, I guess. But I don't, I don't think he was officially called Bowser, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Cause he didn't have like Goombas or anything in the movie, right? It was just like the Koompas no, they, and the. They did, right? <sighs> weren't they, weren't like the big dudes? Goombas, like they were the opposite of what Goombas are. Were those were those the Koopas? I I feel. I think you're right. It's just been a while since I've seen this movie. Since clearly yeah. either either of us have seen it, so yeah. Um, In any case, um, that's a long winded way of me saying uh, I've been very nervous about the return of Mario to the movies. But in my head, I've always been like, well, that movie failed because like they took all the wrong lessons from the game like it's all dark it's not colorful it's not fun it's not springy like the games are and when i heard right. that they were finally making a cg anime movie it's like okay perfect like you know through the wonders of cg as the games are you know you can finally make this big large colorful you know wondrous world into a, a cinematic playground and when i heard illumination got involved i was like okay i mean like i really hope they don't minionize this but you know, they have the, the capital to make a blockbuster out of this. Hopefully it doesn't uh, turn out for the worse. And then they announced the cast. And that's where I remember feeling that kind of anxiety, I guess, if that's a word for the film. Right. Because, Maybe yeah, we got confusion. Yeah, confusion, I guess, is a better <laughs> word. Yeah, because, like, you got Chris Pratt as Mario, which is just... It's not even that it's bad, it's just confusing. And like you said, it's just like, well, Chris Pratt? <laughs> like, I mean nothing against like the Lego movie or anything. Like obviously he can be a talented voice actor, but like Mario. And then you have like Charlie day as Luigi, which makes a little bit more sense, a little odd still, but makes sense. Right. Anya Taylor joy as peach. No issue. I mean, it makes sense, I guess as you, I think you're mentioning before Jack black is Bowser, which yeah, I mean, that sounds like good casting. No issue yeah, there. Put it's Jack like, black in more stuff, honestly. So, Oh yeah. I mean, cause he was like <laughs> flirting with retirement at one point. Uh, maybe he still is, but um, I hope he isn't cause he's one of our great talents. And then you have like Seth Rogen as uh, DK. And it's like, I don't know. I just, it's just a very, it, it I, I worry because, you know, it's kind of the DreamWorks effect where it's like, are they picking these people because they're right for the part? Or are they picking them because they look attractive on the poster in like a DreamWorks 2000s era sort of right. way? Right. Just just their name looks attractive on the poster because their face is right. it's animated film, right? They're not going to yeah. be on the poster. So. Exactly. Yeah. So, right. but I mean, I, yeah. Uh, but I want to give them the benefit of the doubt because, like, you know, like I said, Chris Pratt's proven himself as a voice actor. Maybe he has the chops. I don't know. They, they're very secretive about this voice. I remember uh, right. revealing it. But uh, like, what, yeah. what you compared it to was the the Lego movie, which you know that's just a Emmett, a, a generic character. He's not portraying an iconic character in pop culture. So, like, yeah, I mean, I guess we should, mm-hmm. we'll see if he has it has what it takes to 
you know, portray right. somebody that everybody has an image of what he should sound like in their head, you know? Mm-hmm. So, right. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Um, and we should say, uh, I have to look up his name, but the original voice actor for Mario. It's uh, uh, Charles, Charles Mar- Martinet or something like that. Yeah. He is in the film, to be fair. Oh, is he? Okay. Uh, it hasn't been disclosed what role he's going to be. It's rumored that he's going to play Mario and Luigi's father, which would make sense. Like if they're like supposed to be sort of second generation Mario brothers, uh, you know, like born and raised in America, like, I, that would maybe explain why they went with Charlie Day and Chris Pratt as far as like, you know, not traditional Italian actors as it were. Um, but yeah, now we've heard the voice. I want to hear from you. Like, what was your reaction when you watched the trailer and you finally got a chance to hear what Chris Pratt was bringing to the fold as Mario? Uh, so before this podcast, I went back and rewatched it, the trailer again. Um, and I was really confused because he says one line. The first line he says is like, where am I or something? And it's just like standard Chris Pratt voice. No, like, right. voice. You know, no, no like change was like Jack Black changes his voice up for bowser sounds great mm-hmm. but like he's just sounds like chris pratt and then in the next show when he's like jumping on those mushrooms he says like um mushroom kingdom here we come and it's like yeah a smidge of like an italian accent or something you know some kind of like brooklyn accent maybe or something mm-hmm. and it's like uh, was it did they just pick two weird like scenes that mesh together that they didn't you know it just sounded weird or like we, which which voice we're going to get out of chris pratt here i guess you know that's I'm just, conf- you know, just to harp back on what we said earlier, just confused mm-hmm. still, I guess. I right. guess, you know, we haven't seen enough, but the first little tidbits they gave us are weird, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> uh, well, for one, I thought it was very bizarre that they didn't take that opportunity to have Mario say Mamma Mia when he came into uh, oh yeah, uh, Mushroom Kingdom. Right. But, you know, it seemed like a given, but, you know, maybe they didn't want to reveal that in the teaser but um (laughs) they're saving that yeah yeah but yeah i mean the joke i keep seeing is that uh you know that second line that you're referring to it's like mario is doing an impression of linda from bob's burgers yes it's very i saw that too yep (laughs) which i mean (laughs) i don't know i mean it's a choice it's you know i think i'd prefer that over just traditional pratt like it's me mario voice i'd rather he do something exaggerated but of the two, I don't know which one's really better per se. Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't until I saw the internet comparison of that second one that I, you know, now you can't unhear it once <laughs> once you hear it again. So when I when I first heard that the first time I watched the trailer, I was like, oh yeah, that sounds you know fine. He's at least trying. He's trying something. And then yeah, once I saw the Linda L- L- Linda Belcher thing, that's you know that's all I can hear now. So right, Mushroom Kingdom, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's my general roundabout thoughts. It's a teaser, so you don't, it's hard to like speculate too much at this point. But, uh, were there any other thoughts you had about the, the trailer besides what we've talked about already? Uh, I mean, just coming from, you know, a fan of the games and everything, I was glad they showed, you know, a lot of smaller characters and things that were going to be in it. Like, you know, we got, um, the, the penguins, the Koopas, the, even, you know, when they're, the dry bones chasing Luigi at the end there. And we only got a tiny little bit of, um, Charlie days voice as Luigi, which was just kind of like, a, ex- it was just like an expression. It wasn't even like a, a line. It wasn't even he, a word. He just screamed, <laughs> I think. Right. He yeah. Like, yeah. Ah! Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> exactly. Writing. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, overall, I think it, it looks really good. Like it looks really nice. Oh, it yeah. looks like, I mean, it's, I think the whole problem is aside from Mario, like I feel like everything about the Mario, even, you know, the casting and the, his character model, like looks kind of a bit off, but like Bowser looks fantastic, you know, and then every, everybody else, even Luigi looked fantastic. I just feel like, I don't know, something with Mario just doesn't feel right. Yeah. I, it took me a minute to figure out what was off about the Mario design. And I realized that he kind of looks like they took the Mario design, but, put it on fix it Felix from Wreck-It Ralph. Who, right. I thought the same thing actually. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess fix it Felix is supposed to be a parody of sorts of Mario. So that kind of makes sense, but also just kind of, it just doesn't look like what you expect Mario, but it's like not wrong. It's just like off. It's very bizarre. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And like, even too, you know, along with more internet things, I, I've seen people tweaking of the design slightly and like, it just, 
they either like extended his torso or like condensed his torso, gave him a little more of a belly or something. And like just that, and like maybe like um, shrinking his face a little bit, just like the little like tweaks made him look, you know, more like the Mario you're expecting. So yeah, maybe we'll have another Sonic situation where <laughs> enough people complain and then they'll redo the whole Mario um, character model, I guess. Character design, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It just got, yeah, I mean, it reminds me, there's a, a mini game in Mario Party 2 where you can, like, contort, like, you in a competitive fashion, you have to, like, contort a character's face. Oh, right. To, like, look, and it kind of looks like they did that with Mario, like, they, like, puffed out the cheeks, expanded, like, the the jawline and the nose, and I don't know, it just, yeah, it's just, like, a, it's, a, it's only slightly off, but it's an off enough where it, it, you, you have this set image of Mario from, like, 40 years of video games that's just, like... If you just change it enough, it just it's a little bit irksome, but in a way I feel like I can't complain, but it's just like it still doesn't seem quite right. <laughs> right. Um but it, oh yeah, I don't know. I mean I agree with you, like animation wise, I think it looks stunning. I, I just think it's cool it, it like looks like a blockbuster. It's like an animated film, but it like looks like it you know, it's huge. It's gonna be like expansive. I mean, we only have two mini scenes here, but I mean, I hope it just looks like the the Mario movie I've wanted since I was a kid. Certainly, the one I wanted from the '93 version. But uh, yeah, and it's too early to say with confidence that it's going to work. But I'm not. I mean, I want to see more, which is you know the sign of a, an effective teaser. But yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, I'm still feeling anxious and excited at the same time. Right, right. I I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I obviously wait till we see more but for right now yeah still a little bit on the fence i guess yeah and well i guess we'll just have to reconvene when there's a official trailer or second teaser or whatever is going to come up next but yeah i mean hoping for the best uh maybe maybe not expecting the worst given what we've seen in 93 but right just hoping it's an improvement at the very least if, if they can just clear that bar then we're gonna get somewhere <laughs> yeah at least look wise they're there so yeah i mean i feel at least confident that like yeah like you mentioned there's sonic there was like tech the pikachu a couple years ago like we're getting to a point now where video game movies are getting better i don't know if we've gotten like the first official good or even great video game adaptation film yet but progress is being made like we're getting there kind of gradually i guess it took 30 years but it's coming along <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, unless you disagree, I don't know. Do you have any strong video game film adaptation opinions? No, I mean, right. I'm I'm with you there. I mean, yeah, it's we've definitely had a lot of not great ones throughout the years. I feel like, yeah, the, the you know, it's almost like you need to stick with you know, video games are an animated art form, I guess, in a way as well. So it's almost stick with the animation, you know, so that it's it, it translates better, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest hurdle that's been found of late is just that, like, how do you recapture that excitement that you feel playing a video game in film form? Like, you, you know, so many other video game movies have just, like, kind of tried to copy and paste it, but, you know, taking out the, the controller. And so you're just, like, basically watching someone play the video game you like, but you're not able to play it. And so <laughs> that's been, kind of been the trouble for, you know, most of the the past uh video game adaptations that we've seen but now we're it seems like at least they're just kind of taking a traditional story format certainly like you know the 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 story of sonic or the story of detective pikachu isn't especially novel but they're competent like they they feel like films and you know it, it takes like the appeal of those characters but gives it a you know cinematic flourish which is undeniably you know progress but i i don't know if that's going to be the case for super mario brothers movie or if it's just going to be uh, a big step down i guess we'll see yeah i mean time will tell for sure so sure yeah i guess that's enough about mario unless you have any other <laughs> big thoughts i feel like amsterdam is just awaiting no yeah i mean that's that's enough i mean we'll uh till, till then i'll keep playing some mario games and enjoying it sure. until you know we see what happens so do you have a favorite mario game uh, I feel like, you know, you had mentioned Mario Party 2 or whatever, which mm-hmm. was probably on N64, I believe. Yep. And, you know, we're from that same generation, obviously, growing up mm-hmm. on N64. I feel like mine's uh, Mario 64. Like, just the, um, you know, just the 3D, you know, 
you know, platform game yeah. or whatever. It was, you know, that's just an iconic childhood memory, nostalgia for me. So yeah, that's probably my favorite one. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, and that's, if I had to guess, honestly, that's probably my second favorite already. So I think, I think we're pretty much in line in that, at least as far as like the video games are concerned. Though I, I guess we don't disagree about the trailer either. So we're, we're in agreement all around. So right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Very yeah. agreeable so far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see if that continues. <laughs> uh, doing a transition here into Amsterdam. The new film, as I mentioned, from writer director David O. Russell. Um, so you have kind of, uh, you don't have that much familiarity we were talking about with David O. Russell. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I think the only thing I've seen was American Hustle, which I've only seen about half of it. So, okay. Yeah. And so Amsterdam is, now, too. But yeah. yeah so, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So this is the first, like, full, full length. A Russell movie you've seen, I guess. I didn't realize that going into this. Right. I, I want to say, because I know you had, you mentioned a couple other ones, and I may, I think there is one I may have seen. I'm, oh, Silver Linings Playbook. I have seen that. Okay, I was so. going to say, I mean, if you hadn't, at least, I was going to say, because I think that's probably his best film at this point. I feel like that's kind of the, the, the perfect balance as far as, like, he has these movies where they sort of mirror the chaos that happens behind the scenes in a weird way. They, they, it's a lot of chaotic energy in the films. It's like a very, they're all sort of busy. They all have these sort of like high minded characters kind of embittered with each other, kind of back and forth. But that one's the one where he kind of found a mainstream way to kind of capture that with a character who, you know, obviously uh, is mentally ill, but he's able to kind of find this other character who, you know, he can form this odd sort of uh, friendship then relationship with. And I don't know, I, I think he's very good with actors. I think he can kind of find that spark, that sort of uh, spontaneity, but also just that that um, genuine sense of like charisma and, you know, star power and and uh, dramatic appeal that can really uh, boost some great performances. Um, if you haven't, I mean, I would recommend Three Kings. uh from the nineties. I mean, there's also, uh, I heart Huckabees, which I think you said you started that one too and didn't like that much. No, I've never, never okay. started that one. I have the fighter on my watch list. Okay. That's it. Yeah. The fighters queued up. That one's yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, and then he did most recently before this joy, which yeah, kind of got a mixed response. I think it's a little bit better than some people give it credit, but it's definitely weaker than his earlier films. It's definitely where you can kind of start to see, the the fabric starting to break a little bit. You can kind of tell that he he's getting a little too big for his britches. And then he took this long break, seven years, and he comes back, you know, with this new movie Amsterdam. But he's kind of coming into things in a different sort of social political climate. Like obviously he has this reputation that precedes him as far as like being a notoriously sort of uh, neurotic and hard to work with filmmaker. He had this incident on I Heart Huckabees where he was yelling at Lily Tomlin. Also, I think yelling at Dustin Hoffman. Uh, like he just, he has this history that goes with like his other movies, like uh, American hustle. Obviously I think there was an incident with um, three Kings where George Clooney like punched him or something. He just has very chaotic sets. Uh, and you know, he has this sort of reputation where it's like, okay, like obviously He's a hard person to work with, but he makes all these films that do well critically and commercially and award season wise. And it's like, OK, you can kind of deal with it because of that. But now is, is the star is starting to fade a little bit, I guess, with this film. And I feel like it's kind of the straw that broke the camel back, the camel's back in some ways as someone who's watched a lot of his films and gotten to this point. But um, yeah, let's kind of break down the plot a little bit. And I want to hear then a little bit more from your reaction and your kind of general opinion on the film. So. General plot, uh, super star-studded film, as David Russell films tend to be. This one centers mainly on Christian Bale and John David Washington as two World War I buddies who uh, um, they have these kind of long-standing injuries that they've sustained from the war, but they also have this pact that they formed where they're going to stay friends and stay committed to each other through thick and thin and uh, when their old general dies, played by Ed Bagley Jr., they're called by his daughter, played by Taylor Swift, to do this sort of makeshift autopsy before the funeral because she suspects that there is some foul play, that he might have been poisoned or there's, someone might have tampered with his livelihood and well-being and uh, some the fair nefarious characters are afoot uh, of course they find out that there is some bad stuff happening but in the process of 
you know, disclosing information, some bad things happen and they get framed for murder. So they're on the run and they're trying to clear their name. And in the process of doing so, they reconnect with a woman named Valerie, who was a nurse uh, during their time at war. And they kind of also formed a short, sort of uh, kingship with her. And they had this three-way pact that they would stay by each other's side through thick and thin. Uh, that obviously broke a long time ago. And now there's this weird sort of, uh, you know, uh, odd, like, they're still friends, but there's this, you know, there's obviously some some conflict blooming, blooming between them, and that's certainly the case with Valerie and John David Washington's character, who I think was his name Howard. Am I remembering correctly? Um, I, I, <laughs> I Harold. 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 That's right, Harold. <laughs> and Christian Bale. I forgot to mention his name, Bert. So that's the general plot. It's kind of hard to describe because, like, that's like a super busy synopsis and that's like barely cracking the surface of what happens. <laughs> right. Yeah, like there's like, I'm yeah. confused now and I've seen the movie. So, right. Yeah. Cause there's like, there's <laughs> flashbacks, flash forward. There's like two or three narrators. Uh, you know, there's all these side characters. I didn't even mention the, the other cast members. There's Anya Taylor joy. There's Rami Malik. There's Mike Myers. There's Michael Shannon. There's Zoe Saldana, Timothy Oliphant, Andrea Risenborough. Uh, Alessandro Navala, um, Robert De Niro, a bunch of other people I can't think of. Uh, yeah, it's a stacked cast, and you can certainly see why, given o. Russell's pedigree. But I want to hear from you first, Mike. So, coming into this film, not having been initiated too much with o. Russell's style, kind of coming in fresh outside of one or two other films, what was your general impression of the film, and did it live up to what expectations you had going into it? Right. So being once again, as I've only seen Silver Linings Playbook and part of American Hustle and part of the reason I have only seen part of American Hustle is because I didn't enjoy it too much. I thought it was kind of boring from what I can remember. And also, too, just to go back, I didn't realize that that was almost 10 years ago now that that movie came out. That's that's. Insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, wow, that's that's crazy. Um, but so, you know, I had also maybe had heard some of the um, buzz around this movie before we went to go see it, hearing it wasn't too great. So I was like, great, another David O. Russell movie, stacked cast, that's just going to be not great. And so we saw it, and, you know, obviously, we always talk about, we try to go into movies open-minded, you know, forget about what people are saying, we're going to go and enjoy it, see what we think about it, come out with our own opinions. Uh, But unfortunately, uh, I agreed with what I had heard and what I had thought going into it which was it was not gonna be great and that's <laughs> that's what i thought so yeah i mean i guess i went in slightly more optimistic than you i'd certainly obviously heard a lot of the reviews and i didn't walk in knowing anyone who was at least terribly going to bat for it, which is usually a bad sign like sometimes we'll see films that are like divisive or like i hear like at least a couple people being like yeah it wasn't that bad or like oh it's actually pretty good i don't know why people are uh, bad mouthing it. This one, at least when I went into it, I didn't know anyone that was even like, yeah, it's all right. Like everyone was like, at best, like, eh, that was kind of disappointing, which is not a great sign. <laughs> but uh, you know, like I said, like you said, um, try to go in open minded, hope for the best. Obviously, I like most of his other movies, so I'm like, okay, maybe it'll just be something. Maybe I'll be the one guy that goes bad for this film, and I can't say I am. Uh, because I feel like uh, this is the moment where that that chaoticness, that the the busyness of Russell's style just kind of out exceeds him. Like in a way that I feel like his other movies have been against the odds, uh, able to kind of make harmony with that sort of chaotic energy, like that that busyness, that sort of fr- the precision, the friction that happens. I feel like he's kind of able to make a film that's spirited and kind of spunky. And and kind of has this weird sort of prickly charm to it. I guess I say that certainly being more positive on American Hustle than you are, obviously. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just you, I, I guess really seen the whole thing, so I yeah, that's true. Yeah, I've <laughs> seen really the say. end of it. Yeah, I mean, I guess with that film, I can at least see the conceit where it's like that movie is very openly copying Scorsese's homework. But that movie, it's like kind of like 
every Scorsese film has this very competent control of style and tone. And it's just like every, even when the characters, like in a movie like Goodfellas or Wolf of Wall Street, even when the characters are sort of outsized and like kind of full of this rambunctious energy, like the film themselves have very formal and pristine kind of control. And I like that movie. It's kind of like, well, what if the movie sort of matched their outside personalities and like what if we kind of made a film where the movie itself is sort of representing how kind of self-indulgent and uh oversized and egotistical these characters are and maybe it's me being very charitable in my read of that film but i feel like that was my at least my my perception of what o russell was trying to do with that so i I feel like i can walk away being like even if that doesn't work as well as, as his earlier films i can at least appreciate that but yeah i don't know i mean like this seems to have a lot of the same problems I had with Joy, which is just that I don't really get the sense of what O. Russell wanted to do with this property. I have an idea of what I think he was trying to go for, but I wanted to hear from you, like having seen the film and, you know, having been able to kind of sit with it for a little bit, like what do you think is like his intent? Like, what do you think was his ambition with this story? Uh, man, I don't know. I'm being put on the spot here. Jeez. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean uh, to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I feel like we talked about it a bit a- afterwards and it was like, you know, it, it kind of seemed like, and I mean, this is supposed to be a, this is a true story, right? Or like uh, based on a true story. Correct. Like, um, that's what it said. At least I don't know if it's like a Fargo yeah, effect where it's not really at right. all, but um, I, I would say more because Fargo, I think is almost entirely fictitious, but right. Fargo, I think is hundred percent. Right. Right. There's like, so there's a character that Robert De Niro plays called the general and his character is based in fact. And I think there's like a couple of events, like there's like, Without getting too into spoilers, there there is like a secret organization that is shown like kind of towards the end of this film that is based in truth, kind of in that historical transition from World War One to World War Two. Like I think that's where the truth lies, but everything else, including like the main characters, are entirely fictitious. Right, like, right. It's, it's like, yeah, like it would be like if the movie Titanic, the only thing that was real was just that there was a ship called the Titanic. Like that, like there's obviously a little bit more to truth in that film, but it'd be like the equivalent of that as far as Amsterdam's relationship to reality. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I remember at the end too, they did show like that um, comparison shot with the Nero reading that script or whatever. Um, you know, next to the shot of the actual general guy he was playing. So right, it is true, but right, like you're saying, it's probably just a lot of uh, made up stuff in there for sure. Um, but yeah, so I guess go, going along those lines, um, it, you know, it, it tried to kind of make this, I don't know, like a, like a comedy drama out of, with a history thing in it, you know, and like it, it, it just, it, he tried to do like too much, I guess. And it, I don't know, for me, it, and a lot of people, I guess it didn't really work out. Um, cause the, the comedy was strange cause there was characters who were being serious and then they right. would, you know try to throw a joke in there. Like, was it, was that a joke or was that just the, the character being weird? And then, you know, you had people who are comedians like Mike Myers and, uh, it, it, you know, he just seemed out of place almost in this movie. Like it, it, it was just very strange. A lot of the, a lot of the choices for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't heard any interviews or like read anything from O. Russell, but the vibe I get from seeing the film is that I think he's trying to tell the story in a sort of pointed and timely way. As far as like, obviously, like I said, it's sort of this transition point between World War One and World War Two. We have, you know, the lingering after effects of the First World War are still apparent and pretty obvious as far as like tons of uh, civilians are still, you know, suffering from these ailments and, you know, injuries from the war. But broadly speaking, no one really wants to help them. Everyone just kind of wants to pretend the war is over with and wants to move on. And only a character like uh Bert played by Christian Bale can really accept that because he just lives with these injuries like he he can't ignore them because it's his life and so he's like one of the few people who can like you know come to their aid but he's trying to find this like uh cure all elixir that just doesn't really exist and it's kind of similar to you know uh, John David Washington and Marco Roby's characters who they had this sort of uh nirvana point in Amsterdam this kind of safe haven with Christian Bale, where it's like they could kind of put the war away and like 
find this sort of peace that's been absent through most people's lives at this time. And they chose for, you know, multiple reasons to move away from that. And now they're kind of trying to figure out, can they find that point in this place when like the world war, world war two is on the horizon, you know, the, the rise of Nazi party is here and all this stuff. And it's like, can we fight this like rising fascism? And also can we kind of find our own kind of sense of like stability and peace amid, you know, present and future wars, which I think that's just my read. Like, I think that's what o. Russell was trying to do here, which is obviously like a very present kind of story that you can kind of draw from the past, but like find ripple f- effects for the now. But I feel like if that was its intent, like I have to really search for that. <laughs> like I have to like think about that and find it on my own because the film itself is so chaotic and just fussy and trying to like do all these different things with all these supporting characters and other you know personalities that like that's just a very small fraction of what's a very large and just sort of like unruly film by and large right and now that you just said that i'm like oh yeah i guess that's what he was probably trying to do but like my initial explanation just a few minutes ago didn't make any sense. Kind of like the movie, you know, it was like, it was all over the place. Right. So <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? Is that like, I feel like if you asked Evo Russell, he'd probably give you five answers. Cause I don't honestly think he has like watch a film. I feel like this is a filmmaker who's like kind of lost in the weeds of what he wants to do. We, we were talking about this after the film. Like, I feel like he probably had an intent when he wrote the film. And like when he showed up to set, he had an idea. But when he was filming it, he probably you know allowed for a lot of improvisation, or he like allowed his actors kind of like make up some new lines, or kind of like build in their characters in different ways. Or maybe he didn't even have like a fully fleshed out script from the get go. But like when he was filming it, it seemed like he kind of like allowed for all these different ideas to come into play, which is fine. You know, the the creative process can allow these things. But when he edited it, it just kind of seemed like he cobbled them all together like a stew. And that was like, it's like a hodgepodge of all these different things. And when you watch the final film, it just feels like, I, I don't know, like what, what's the intent anymore? Cause it seems like you're trying to do six things at once and they're all sort of contradicting it, yourself. Like at this, at this point, at the present point when you, when we're watching this film. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, after, after we saw it, that was definitely a big, big thing we discussed was just feeling um, le- like they did so many takes and by the end of it, they were like, what, what's even our, what's our motive anymore? What are we even doing? And he's like, just keep acting. It's great. You guys are doing great. And like, yeah, I mean, in their own, probably, you know, Rami Malek and Anya Taylor Joyce characters, like in their individual scenes, they're, they're doing great stuff. But when you put it together in the movie, it doesn't make sense as a whole, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I certainly found the performances by and large were just very uneven, like I, not only in terms of like what they were doing individually, but just like some actors I thought were like fine. Some were like pretty good. Some were like holding their own, but obviously I've seen them do better. And some were just like, you know, I, I thought some people in this movie were just outright bad, <laughs> like embarrassingly. So, uh, but I wanted to hear more directly from you. Like what were the performances that stood out to you, like good or bad? Right. Yeah. Um, Definitely, you know, kind of having more time to think about this movie and seeing, you know, trailers on TV and things like that. Like Christian Bale, I feel like knocked out of the park. He was fantastic, like memorable. Great, yeah. Like, you know, we've seen a lot of movies that have been not great and I forget everything about them. But this movie, I definitely feel like his performance, you know, sticks with me. It was it was just great. It was entertaining. And, you know, it was he did a lot of unique stuff, a lot of creative stuff. And just, you know, he, he got into the character and, you know, he gave a great performance. But yeah, everybody else, I mean... And I, I said this as well, like John David Washington, I just feel like he just kind of showed up and tried to be like, hey, I'm John David Washington. And for <laughs> me, it didn't work. I right. just thought he was flat and not very you know, believable or just entertaining in general. Um, Margot Robbie, you know, she had OK moments, uh, but I feel like sh- there was moments where her, her accent kind of came out like her, you know, a real accent. She, you know, so um, I mean, that's the, the main three w- were. You know, Christian Bale, fantastic. Those mm-hmm. two, not so much. Um, and then everyone else, the movie just kind of, I don't know. They were just there. I don't really remember <laughs> too much. Fair enough. About yeah. That. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious because, like, you know, like, like we said, like, this is such a star studded film. And obviously, like, most of these cast members we've seen do really great stuff. Obviously, I think we kind of disagreed after film as far as like John David Washington's career co- is concerned. Like, I, I think he's. You know, done a few films at least where I I think he's proven himself as a up and coming action or 
at least a, an upcoming movie star. But yeah, this one I have to agree with you. I just yeah, it, it, I found myself kind of asking that question of like, why do I like D- John David Washington? <laughs> like, <laughs> like what is he really bringing here? Like watching his films, like it just. It's hard because, like, I mean, you didn't, I guess you didn't notice uh, watching a film, but like, obviously, he's uh, uh, David Denzel Washington's son, and he's, you know, he has like maybe, you know, he, he's, he got some doors open that other actors wouldn't, but he also has to deal with the pressure of like, okay, you're Denzel Washington's son. You're the son of quite possibly our best working movie star. Show us what you got. And, you know, he's, you know, sometimes proven himself, sometimes not, but it's kind of like, okay. You know, if you have that pressure, any actor can kind of, you know, uh, stumble as far as like coming into the gate, like with those expectations in place. But, you know, like I said, like you still kind of want something there. Like you kind of want that that spark that he brings, like even to some of uh, his lesser performances, you, you can watch like a bad movie with Denzel Washington. You're still like, kind of uh, magnetized. Cause it's just like he just does even like a little thing that captures your interest or you like, you know, he just has that innate movie star charisma that's undeniable and i don't know i feel like john david washington just hasn't gotten that at least not yet at least but um i don't know yeah it's certainly not in this film at least but uh yeah i mean i i definitely agree with you as far as uh marco roby and um christian bale are concerned I, yeah i found roby it, it was kind of like a flighty performance like it, it just seemed like you know, like she holds her own fine in certain scenes, but I just never like if you tried to like if or sorry, if I tried to like break her performance down and like explain five things about a character, I would fall short of three. Like I don't really have much I can like I know she was a nurse. I know that she had like a love affair with the uh, um John David Washington's character, and like I know that she's on hard times now, but it's like, I don't, I don't know if that's a failure of like underwriting the character or just her, just not really bringing a whole lot to this performance that she's brought into other far better films. But yeah, it just, it just was uh, underwhelming in that respect. But yeah, I don't know. Christian Bale still as ever, just, uh, he brings this innate, you know, physicality to his uh, performances. This like, you know, sense that like, I feel like every single Christian Bale performance is different from one another, but every, Christian Bale performance is truly a Christian Bale performance. Like I can't imagine anyone else but him kind of doing what he does with a film. And it's a sort of this uh, singular ability of his that uh, I thought really stood out here because everyone else was uh, not bringing it. <laughs> so it's just proved once more. It's like, oh yeah, that's why he's like one of our great working movie actors. Right. Yeah. I mean, Exactly. And I mean, I just want to go back to the uh, John David Washington thing. I don't know. For me, at least, I, I was calling it the Brad Pitt effect. Cause I feel like Brad Pitt just shows up and he's like, I'm Brad Pitt. What's up? Let's go. But like it's the same thing with you know Denzel. He's he's they're both huge guys have proven themselves in great movies. And like they, they can do that. They can just show up and they're like, oh, my God, I love this movie because you're because you're Brad Pitt or you're Denzel. But like for me, John David Washington isn't. I mean, yeah, I, I enjoyed Tenet. I thought he was fine in that. But yeah, I haven't really seen. I mean, I, you mentioned uh, what Black Black Klansman, and um, yeah, I remember. I, I can't really remember him in that movie, so I can't can't say anything about it. But um, yeah, I just well, I guess it like, proves your point then. Uh, <laughs> right there, you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I just I don't know. I just now it makes more. Once you told me that he was Denzel's son, I was like, it makes total sense now because I didn't think anything special of him from the moment I saw him. So <laughs> hmm. nepotism at work right here. Fair enough. Um, I don't know. I, I'm still going to go bad for him, but I agree. It's like <laughs> he, he has to, that next performance of his has to do something. Cause I mean, this, I'm not seeing it with this one, unfortunately, but um, yes. I don't know. I'll go bad for some of the supporting players, at least. Um, I mean, I feel I have, I, I, I feel obligated at least to bring up Mike Myers, uh, who I thought was, pretty fun in this i mean you know has maybe like four scenes in total but i thought you know he's the only one that really seems to like kind of be clued in on like what he's supposed to do and like you know bring he, he's more successful with his comedic beats than i think most other actors are in this movie uh certainly kind of compared to some of the the starrier performances who were trying to be funny like uh you know i i love anya taylor joy but i don't really know what she's trying to do in this movie <laughs> uh unfortunately uh you know bless her heart for trying but just like i don't know what's going on same with the alessandro 
Navola, who, I mean, I thought he was great. And uh, did you ever see The Art of Self-Defense? Well, I got to look up who this guy is because I don't even know. Was he the Fair one enough. cop guy? Yeah, he was like the, the bumbling cop. Right, okay. Yeah, no, I've never seen that movie. But yeah, I was going to bring up him as well because I didn't know what his what his whole deal was either. <laughs> right. Like, they kept focusing on him in a way. It was just like, is he like going to be important? Or is he just like supposed to be funny I mean, it's just like i don't know it's just like constant dead air when he's around like he just keeps fumbling and it's like supposed to be like uproarious and it's just like okay can we just move this along so we can get back to the mystery plot that we're supposed to be telling here i thought <laughs> right yeah uh, like, yeah like the scene when he i don't know, he picked up a some kind of glass thing and he almost broke it or something it, and there was right. like yeah a beat and you're like okay it was was that supposed to be a joke or like right Right. So yeah, it, it was very very strange. Didn't right. didn't get his whole shtick. Yeah. But um I don't know. I mean, I thought like Zoe Saldana, you know, her scenes were pretty strong. Like, I mean, I don't know. I thought there was like kind of like a like a tenderness to her performance that was sort of lacking in most of the other parts of this film. Like for a film that's like constantly so busy, constantly kind of just trying to fill the frame with stuff. I appreciate that her moments were kind of allowed to breathe a little bit and just kind of be present in a way that most of the other movie just wasn't <laughs> like, it was just kind of like constantly like anxious to like do stuff. Like it felt like it, it couldn't like just lay idle in a way that her scenes were able to be a little bit more contemplative and, you know, reserved. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I don't know. I can't say anyone else in this cast other than De Niro who, you know, De Niro's De Niro. He's going to be good. It's, it's noteworthy if he's bad and he's not bad in this film. So, uh, yeah, everyone else I thought, yeah, would just was, uh, if not a disappointment, just underwhelming at the very least. I mean, certainly like Ma- Malik, I, I feel like him and Mike Myers should stop working together. Cause <laughs> I, I guess, well, you liked, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, I guess I, I, I won't badmouth that movie too much if you're a fan, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I remember enjoying it. That's, fair enough. That's all I can say about that. So, and I mean, you know who else enjoyed it? Who? The Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences. <laughs> they gave it like two Oscars, right? The At only, least. the only people who matter, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> they love the editing and Rami Malek's performance at the very least. So that's right. Uh, yeah. I think so. they did get other Oscars. I can't even remember anymore. But um, yeah, I can't remember either. But yeah, that's right. He did win. Yeah, best. Uh, yeah, best, best actor, actor for that. So yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just it so, was the teeth. It was all the teeth. Yeah, it was the teeth and the accent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, him lip singing some of the greatest songs ever performed. So that's the way he won an Oscar, I guess. I mean, if you if you ever wanted to know, take notes. Uh, yeah, that's how you do it. <laughs> um, I don't know. So I I don't think anyone's gonna be listening to me, but. Heed my advice, I'd say, Mike Myers, next time you pick a project, your next film, you know, I think he does like a film now, like every four years, I feel like, like it's like Inglorious Bastards and then Bohemian Rhapsody and now this film. So longer than four, maybe eight years. I don't even know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, I just think we have to be happy he's on the big screen, right? I mean, just, yeah. just to see him and stuff. So, I mean, if he keeps getting casted with uh, Rami Malek, just you know, so be it. At least he's <laughs> at least he's getting work, right? <laughs> at least he's working. So I don't know. I'm just saying. I mean, one of the, in my opinion, one of these those three films I mentioned were good, and one of them didn't have Rami Malek. So I think people can kind of uh, you know figure out what's happening there. But right, right, and, and two of them involved, um, you know, World Nazis? War Two esque things. Yeah, yes, exactly. So look yeah. at that. <laughs> there you go um yeah so i don't know i mean do you have any other kind of thoughts about the film we can kind of start wrapping it up unless you have anything else to say uh, no i mean i'm just going through the cast and you know chris rock i don't think we mentioned him he oh was, chris yeah i was so, gonna admit, he's embarrassing in this film i think like i felt bad think for so? him i thought you do not think so i mean dude i don't even remember <laughs> I, I, like i remember him being in it but yeah, i don't remember anything about his character oh, okay. or any, anything he did or whatever but yeah so please okay. go on <laughs> and, well no and i just i was just like remind me yes i don't know because i feel like he's I don't know, he's been trying to kind of branch out it seems like like he did spiral he did the most recent season of fargo like it seems like he's pushing himself a little bit more as an actor and i don't think either of them have been super successful obviously spiral was a disappointment as well um and the most recent season of fargo i never even got around to finishing it um, yeah me either yeah 
<laughs> but like I, I admire the intent. Like I, I feel like he's at least trying to push himself. But like this film, like I thought all of his scenes were kind of cringy. Like he was just trying really hard to like make this character work, and the whole thing is just like he is just like telling people don't hang out with white people, and it's like that's the joke told fifteen times. Uh, and yeah, just feel like he. I don't know. It, it was just kind of like a deer in headlights kind of moment. It just seemed like he was just constantly like not sure what he was supposed to be doing. He was probably under directed as a lot of these actors are unfortunately and uh yeah i don't know i just seem i just i just felt bad for him really i guess embarrassing is a strong word i just i guess i just felt bad for chris rock right i mean you, you want to see him do well and it's great seeing him in you know yeah all these new kind of projects but like like what we're saying is none of them have been really panning out for the most part right so um yeah yeah i mean Fargo wanted wanted to watch it, really wanted to, but I don't know, wasn't into it. Yeah, Couldn't did you watch the first three seasons at least? Yeah, I did. I really, okay. I really enjoyed. Well, I enjoyed the first two. Season three okay. was, I don't. Oh, know, really? Th- okay. That was the one with uh, you and McGregor, right? Yeah, I liked season three. Fine. I, it's definitely the weakest of the between right. of, of those three that you mentioned. Right. But. I don't think it was bad. It just wasn't as good as the first two. That's for sure. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh. Well, 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 we didn't really talk about Taylor Swift, I guess, but do you have any thoughts on her performance? Because it's somewhat noteworthy. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say too much, but yeah, I mean, she was she was fine, I guess. Fair enough. I mean, I, yeah. no opinion on her, really. She was just, she was Fair in enough. it. I feel, I feel like that was like a big, um, you know, maybe a selling point for some other people who don't usually see these right. kinds of movies. They're like, oh, Taylor Swift's in it? Sure. Let's do it. Yeah. But, I Yeah, I guess I just bring that because like, it, it's kind of fascinating to see ensemble pieces now at this point, because star power isn't what it was before. Uh, I mean, we're kind of getting to this point where, like, the only way star power can be really effective is if, like, you have a ton of stars all at once. Like, it's like the don't look up effect, where it's just like, it's a it's impressive when you get, like, this many stars in your movie at this point. It's, like, not just enough that you got, like, Christian Bale and Margo Ropey. It's, like, if you got, like, everybody. But I feel like, like, uh, the Taylor Swift addition was the one that seemed to capture most notice it's like this kind of thing with like like harry styles being in um don't worry darling it's just like he's like a bankable name compared to everyone else because like you know he has this innate stan fan base who like you know is gonna actually go out to movies to see it and i don't know if that's gonna be the case with taylor swift based in the box office but it was kind of one of those things where you know it's like oh okay well like this you know taylor swift's in the movie like maybe people will notice younger people will notice but doesn't seem to be a case for kind of obvious reasons, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. alas, yeah. Um, I guess you can well, be all grateful that she's not getting the same ire that uh, Harry Styles is getting for Don't Worry Darling. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, he had a, uh, I mean, he's like the star of that movie, right? Like Taylor Swift's just a true ensemble yeah. cast member. So I mean, A cameo, basically. Right, exactly. You know, kind of like, because Harry Styles was in um, Dunkirk as well, right? As like a tiny, yeah, but tiny like, role. Like, but what can you really say about him and Dunkirk other than he's in it? Right. Not, I don't, does he even have any lines? He might have like a line or two or something. I think three. Right? Okay, I think he yeah, has three so, lines in it. Exactly. So one might have been what's going on with the war or I'm sick of right, the war. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel like, I guess I'm comparing the two just cause it's like Taylor Swift has, you know, she had a, a slightly larger role, but it's like, you know, she was fine in this and Harry Styles was fine in Dunkirk, but it's like we, you throw her a leading role and she might just ruin the whole thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess maybe Taylor Swift is, uh, at least more self-aware in that respect. I mean, but she's really been struggling to get into like an Oscar prestige film. Cause you remember what her last performance was before this one? Uh, no, I don't, I don't remember. Well, I'll give you a hint. It was a certain, major broadway musical ah uh, ah uh, yes cats <laughs> yes cats she was in cats <laughs> ah fantastic so well yeah not really hitting the, the home runs there uh, on the big screen but no but it, it seems like that one fought a lot of the the cast that were somehow unfortunate enough to be put into that one so right yeah i mean i'd say by and large probably cats is more embarrassing than amsterdam Oh, hundred percent for sure. But, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've at least I, seen I mean, one of those yeah. movies. So sure. Oh, you didn't see Cats? No. 
Okay. You didn't have a screening, so I didn't make it out. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess that's my thoughts on answer. Dan, uh, did you have anything else? Um, I did just, just looking at the cast again, real quick. I didn't want to touch on, uh, Timothy Olyphant's like just his. Oh, Timothy makeup. Olyphant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I've been messing names up all day. I feel like over here, but that's um, a, I, I mean, that's, that's been my whole deal from on Cinemaholics since episode one. So what is, I take no issue with it. fixing names. No, messing. I mess up everyone's names. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm right there with you. Then perfect. I'm fitting just in. My first time here. There you go. I'm... Yeah, you're getting you're, <laughs> you're getting right into the cinema cinemaholics formula. See, I can't even get exactly. the name of the podcast right. Yeah, exactly. It's all <laughs> it's all good. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, he looked um, like the makeup and everything for his character, well, and just makeup in general, I guess. Christian Bale and all the like, the war, the wounds from all the uh, soldiers and stuff. Like, I just feel like that you mm-hmm. know they did a good job of making it look you know, realistic and nasty. And like just mm-hmm. Timothy, uh, what is it again? His last name? Timothy Oliphant. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm assuming him. that's what it is. Yeah. Yes. It works for me, you know, yeah. and, unless if he corrects us, that's what we're saying for, from now on. So, um, sure. I, he looked just, you know, like they made him look really grimy and disgusting. Kind of yeah. Like like gnarly. Supposed to be. So I feel like, you know, he, he, mm-hmm. he stood out a bit. I mean, he wasn't in it too much, but yeah, I think just the way they made him look, he looked really, you know, menacing. Mm hmm. Yeah, I take no fault with how the film looks, I'll say. Uh, though, I, yeah, I guess he didn't mention that uh, Emmanuel Lubezki shot the film. Uh, you know, one of our most famous cinematographers. And I don't know, I mean, I, I generally like the way it looks. But I, I will say there was this weird sort of thing where a lot of the film had sort of these like static shots where like it would just kind of hold on the characters for a while in a way that I feel like David Russell's other movies, like the camera is a little bit more like free-flowing and there's some scenes like that in this film but it felt like compared to his other films the camera is a lot more content with being stationary and just kind of holding on the actors and i couldn't tell if that was like a covid thing like because you know like he has such a big cast and like all these different high profile people if like scheduling only allowed people to be like there at certain times and if like with covid and like like there's gaps like he couldn't like I don't know. I'm not really sure what the the reason was there, but I feel like that kind of sapped the energy of certain scenes. Not that it would have like saved the film, but it just kind of highlighted. I feel like how lacking in sort of energy this movie could be. Right. Yeah. And now um, that you just said this cinematographer, I didn't. Re- I was looking up all their stuff, and wow. Yeah. I mean, it fits in with the rest of their resume, like just the look of it, and like the, you know, it had like that a little bit like a, you know, it was a historical piece, but it was like a, the, the bleakness of it a bit, you know, like children of men and gravity and revenant. So like, yeah, I mean, yeah. N- nailed to the look of the film for sure. sure. Definitely, definitely like that. Um, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You know, yeah, it definitely was just, um, the, the flow wasn't quite there for sure. And, uh, a reunion. I just thought about this now between Manuel and and Mike Myers. Do you know why? Uh, please tell me. I don't. <laughs> I uh, Emmanuel Emmanuel Lombeski shot the Cat in the Hat. No way. Yeah, he did. Yeah, three time Oscar winning <laughs> cinematographer Emmanuel Lombeski shot the Cat in the Hat. If you want to hear more about that, listen to the second season of Ain't Ogre Till It's Ogre. Oh my god! Look at that. There you Perfect go. Little plug right there. There we go. It's all connected. Uh, yeah. There we go. Connected in a way that this movie is not. So <laughs> there we go. I think that's a good button to end our conversation on this film but but not before we play the Rotten Tomatoes game. So, oh boy. You you've seen I guess the score at some point but not recently. Is that what you were saying before yes, we recorded? I did I did Google Amsterdam Rotten Tomatoes at uh, one okay. point a few days yeah. ago. So, it may have changed since then. Okay. Well, I'm looking it up now. It's based on 171 reviews. What do you think uh, is the score on Rotten Tomatoes right now? All right. Um, I'm going to say 33%. Very, very close. It is. Oh, okay, actually, I'll let you guess. Do you think it's one below or one above? Uh, one above. Yep, you can hit it right on the head. It's 34%. Well, wow, look at that. Yeah. That's I know. a great did a, Yeah, I mean, I think probably... David Russell's first rotten, I have to imagine, because like a lot of his other movies have gotten like 90, 80%. I think even Joy had like 60 something percent. This is definitely a new low for the filmmaker and uh 
maybe not an unwarranted one, but uh, do you want to guess the audience score? Just mix up a little bit. Uh, sure. Let's say, um, you know what? I'm thinking the audience probably liked a little bit more. Uh, so let's, you know what? Let's give it a 60. All right. Yeah. You're actually extremely close. Do you want to guess a little bit higher or a little bit lower? Um, let's go a little bit lower. 59? Yes. Ah, uh, you should have guessed higher. It was 61. Dang it. Very, very close. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you have a knack for this. You're already, uh, you know, first time playing, you're already better at this than I am. So, right. Well, like I said, that. I, I kind of cheated a bit, so it's not 100% fair. I but... mean, you didn't know the audience score, right? Um, it was probably right next to the critic uh, score. So, you know, I may have seen it and I may also have slightly a photographic memory. No, I'm just kidding. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, no, I, well, either way I was close. Yeah. Do you know about cinema score? Uh, yeah, I do. Do you know you the cinema score for this? As well? No, if you want, oh, no, it's up to you. No, I don't know it. So yeah, I'll tell you, I have no idea what this is. So, okay. This is a pure no, wait, guess. So yeah, is, is cinema score, is this just critics or is this like a whole, is this like the IMDB rating where it's like anybody can rate it? So cinema score is uh, based solely in Las Vegas, and they pull. Uh, I don't know how many audiences. I'm assuming one, like a test audience that sees the film, kind of similar like the type of audience that we saw Amsterdam with, and they're just like, "What grade did you give this film? A to F?" And whatever the average score of that would be is what they give the cinema score. It's a sort okay. of weird, arbitrary thing. I don't know why it matters, but. It's every time like there's box office or whatever for a film, they always refer, uh, always refer to the cinema score as like what audiences are feeling because those audiences in Las Vegas represent the nation at large. So yes, at, as they do, and I mean, as yeah. not not that we're in Vegas seeing these movies, but as we know for these screens, I feel like people there love these movies just probably because they're seeing them for free. Exactly. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's not a it's not a fair metric, I would say, but either probably way, not. Uh, <laughs> either way so this is an a to f rating for this for this movie yep. uh the cinema score for this other minuses and pluses or no yeah you can it could be anything from a flat a to a flat f but there's always like a my or yeah like a minus b plus b minus c plus c minus etc okay. etc I'll, I'll i'll give it a c minus C minus. All right. Not quite on the ball of that one, unfortunately. Do I think it, yeah. it's higher or lower? All right. Um, probably higher. Like, All like right. a B. You, that's exactly right. It's a B, which is also lower than, I guess, uh, your average David Russell movie gets. I'm looking it up. Most of his other movies have gotten between an A minus or a B plus. Like, The Fire got an A minus. Uh, I think Three Kings got a B as well, but like Flirting with Disaster, I forgot to mention that one at the top, uh, got a B plus. Uh, I believe uh, Silver Lines Playbook also got around an A. So, you know, it seems like critics are, you know, more often not more receptive to his films. Or, yeah, critics and also cinema score. But yeah, this one just didn't quite do it for anybody. And the box office has also been pretty dire. I think it made less than eight million on uh, its opening weekend, and the budget is like eighty million. So, not great. Nope. <laughs> so, that, yeah, yeah, David Russell will be casting um, uh, the, you know, this many stars in his next film. Maybe not. Maybe not. We'll have to wait and see, though. If he gets a next film, I don't know. But that's uh, a conversation for another day. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you coming on. And making your podcast debut on Cinemaholics. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Yeah, I'm glad we could do this. Um, so, generally, what we do to wrap up the episode, I, uh, for some reason, we always say, like, from the internet, blank. But we're both from Pennsylvania, so it's up to you. We can just say bye, or we can do that, whatever you feel. Hold on, what what are our, what are our options here? Oh, so, all we, I just, like, generally, because he's from California, so he'll be, like, from the internet, California. I'm John, and I'll say from the internet Pennsylvania, I'm Will. But since we're both in Pennsylvania, I don't know if it, it would just be kind of weird. So we could just kind of end it. What, are, what do you feel? So what I would just say, like, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I'm Mike. And then if that's what say, you want to do? Let's let's do it. All right. Should we do, do it. it the same? Should we do it at the same time, though? Yes, I agree. I think that's what we should do. My light's on <laughs> right now. All right. Um, so let's, yeah, three, two, one, <laughs> internet Pennsylvania. All right. No, we're saying three, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Three, three, two, two, 
one, one. From, from the internet Pennsylvania. <laughs> sorry from, sorry yeah, yeah. We'll, well do it one more time we rehearsed this oh man all right uh, right three two one from, from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania I'm Mike I'm Mike I'm Will <laughs> Wait, you're Will Bye, whatever <laughs> I think that's it we're done <laughs> bye everybody oh man bye everybody love you <laughs> uh,